Well, welcome to uh, this afternoon session. I know you've already been done a lot today and had a lot, a lot of material uh, presented at you, so uh, I'm glad you were able to stick it out here and, and uh, make it to this session. Uh, I'm Richard Weichart. I'm a professor of history at California State University Stanislaus in the United States. Uh, and uh, I, a couple years ago, I put out a book called The Death of Humanity that this talk is going to be based largely upon material that's in this book. I have some flyers for it. They also have some copies of this at the bookstore, at least last time I checked they did. Uh, so you could uh, get there if you're interested in it, uh, go in more depth on some of the material that I'm going to be going into. But I'm going to sort of looking at one particular slice of the, this talk uh, here. And I'm going to look at the way that uh, the value of human life can be looked at as a way of trying to convince people, or at least move people to some degree uh, toward uh, theism and Christianity. So let's just begin with a word of prayer here real quickly, though, too. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time together. We pray that uh, the things that I present will be helpful, beneficial, and will help us to communicate with our culture and with our secular colleagues who need you so desperately but maybe don't know it. We just pray you blessing upon this session now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, it's probably not a surprise to many of you that uh, when I say that secular ideologies over the past couple of centuries have eroded uh, the Judeo-Christian sanctity of life ethic, and that's in fact what my, my book, A Death of Humanity, is all about. So what do I, what do I mean when I'm talking about the Judeo-Christian sanctity of life ethic? Well, the Judeo-Christian view, of course, is that humans are created in the image of God, and that because of that, they have intrinsic value, value in and of themselves, not, uh, not instrumental value, value is for what they can do, but value simply because they're a human being, because we're in God's image. And Genesis 1, verse 27 states that very clearly, that humans are made in the image of God. And there's many other scriptures that, that support that position as well. So today I want to sort of develop an apologetics argument based on the view that human life has value. And so here's the basic argument. I don't actually make the argument quite this way in my book. I'm a little more subtle in the way that I do it in the book. I, I just sort of lay out these ideas in various uh, ways throughout the book. I don't actually say in any place premise one, premise two, and conclusion, but ultimately those ideas are contained in the book one way or another. So the premise one that I start with is if God does not exist, then human life has no intrinsic value, transcendent meaning, purpose, or objective moral significance. Premise two, human life does have intrinsic value, transcendent meaning, purpose, and objective moral significance. Conclusion, therefore, God exists. Now, that doesn't prove the Christian God necessarily, but it does prove theism uh, of some sort. And from there, we can move to other kinds of arguments. If, uh, uh, about the resurrection of Jesus, the historicity of the Bible, miracles, fulfilled prophecies, there's all sorts of other ways we can move once we get to that particular point. But there are a lot of people who are really stuck on this particular issue, and many people uh, believe that human life does not have any particular meaning, significance, and uh, in fact, uh, many atheists and, ag and agnostics and other secular thinkers will agree with premise one. Uh, if you look at the history of thought, uh, you'll find out that uh, many atheists like Friedrich Nietzsche, for example, would say, yeah, that's right. You know, human life doesn't have any intrinsic meaning, purpose, or value. There's no moral significance. There's, we're living beyond good and evil, so there's no you know, objective morality or anything like that. Uh, if you look at uh, Jean-Paul Sartre or the existentialists, many of them will agree with that point. Uh, so if you look like at the existentialist and postmodernist side of thinking, many of them will agree with premise one. Uh, also, many scientific materialists will agree with premise one. Uh, Richard Dawkins makes this very same kind of point in his writings, as do many other uh, scientific materialists. Uh, Jerry Coyne, professor of uh, evolutionary biology at University of Chicago, he's retired now, but he's still writing and still uh, prolific in his uh, promotion of atheism and such. He makes this point a number of places. Let me give one sort of telling example of this. Lawrence Krauss, who's an astrophysicist, uh, who wrote the book called The Universe from Nothing, where he argues that the universe can come out from nothing. Uh, but he doesn't really mean nothing. I don't have time to get into that one. But anyway, he said at one point, not, not in this book, he said this somewhere else, but he said in another place, and he's arguing from an atheistic perspective, of course, he said this about humanity. He said, we're just a bit of pollution. 
if you got rid of us and all the stars and all the galaxies and all the planets and all the aliens and everybody, then the universe would be largely the same. We're completely irrelevant. So that's the idea of one atheist. It's, and that's a pretty common view that you'll find out there among uh, secular thinkers. Uh, he did, uh, Lawrence Krauss also described love as, quote, the firing of neurons and biochemical reactions. Okay? That's all love is. Okay? It's just all about material processes uh, going on uh, in your brain and nervous system and such. And then here's interesting, he, he talks about how this impacts morality, and we talked about moral uh, significance, subjective moral significance. He said, quote, I think that science can either modify or determine our moral convictions. The fact that infidelity, for example, is a fact of biology must, for any thinking person, modify any absolute condemnation of it. That's a kind of weird argument, by the way, because is, that, is he going to say the same thing about rape and murder and other things? The fact that it happens means that we can't make any absolute condemnation. Well, maybe he would go that far. Uh, Dawkins actually one time was pressed on the issue of rape, and he admitted that, well, yeah, there's nothing objectively wrong with it, you know, and such. Uh, so they don't have any reason to think there's any objective morality. And so these kind of ideas about humans... Uh, not having any intrinsic value, transcending meaning, purpose, and objective moral significance then leads us into a lot of the th secular thinking today. Some of it's reflected in ideas like this, uh, where you have people for the ethical treatment of animals. Uh, they took this display uh, all over the United States and also in Europe. I think this one's actually a shot that was from Europe here, uh, there, with, uh, to animals, all people are Nazis. And this was part of their Holocaust on your plate display. And so the idea was that factory farming of chickens is just as bad as the Holocaust. Okay, so the fact that we're murdering these chickens you know, by eating them. Uh, so they're drawing moral equivalences uh, between humans and animals. <clears throat> Thing that we're no more significant, there's no, no, no more significance of humans uh, than of animals. And that's a very prominent idea among some secular thinkers. So, premise one, then, I think we can actually find a lot of agreement if you're talking with secular thinkers, that they will say, okay, yeah, you're right. You, you're really, if, if atheism is true, then there really is no moral significance, uh, no special purpose for humans. So, it's premise two that I think is going to be a more difficult one to get at, but I think we can get at it by showing the contradictions in their own thinking that because they really do believe that human life has value. They'll, they'll, they'll deny it when they're talking philosophically about what the philosophical implications are of their worldview. But when they start getting around to how they treat people and how they deal with things in their life, I mean, I guarantee you that Lawrence Krauss, when he's uh, telling uh, a woman that he loves her, he is not thinking, oh, this is just a bunch of neurochemical reactions in my brain, you know, and it doesn't make any difference. You know, he's not thinking that way. And so I think we can get at premise two by, first of all, showing inconsistencies of those that uphold these kind of worldviews. And then second of all, by illustrating some of the consequences of those worldviews uh, to those who uh, try to follow it consistently. And so I'm going to take both of those in turn, first to show the inconsistencies and then to try to deal with the implications or consequences of that. <clears throat> so I give a lots of examples of this uh, in Death of Humanity. I'm only going to be able to give a few examples, but one of the most powerful examples that I came across that I really didn't know a lot about, I mean, I knew some about his life and his philosophy and such, but I really didn't know these particular examples until I started researching this book, is Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell was a very famous early uh, 20th century British philosopher, probably the most famous early 20th century British philosopher. Uh, basically a positivist. He believed that scientific knowledge is their only path to truth. Uh, and uh, he clearly believed that humans were, uh, had no objective purpose, moral significance. Let me give you a quotation from him that he wrote, something he wrote in 1903. Uh, that makes this extremely clear. And again, this is a pretty common viewpoint among a lot of secular thinkers. It's not just his ideas. Here's what he said about humanity. He said, quote, this is kind of a long quotation, so it's a long sentence, so please bear with me here. He says, that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs, 
are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. I really like that turn of phrase there, by the way. Accidental collocations of atoms. That's all our loves and hopes, fears, that's all that is. This just, they're just the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. And then he goes on to say that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual beyond the grave that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins, all these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Okay, that's what he wrote in 1903. And there's, by the way, shots of Bertrand Russell uh, in his youth and then in his older age. <clears throat> uh, in 1925, he spelled out a little more clearly what that meant for his vision of humanity. He said in an essay, he said, quote, the philosophy of nature must not be unduly terrestrial. In other words, centered around the earth. For it, he said, the Earth, is merely one of the smaller planets of one of the smaller stars of the Milky Way. And then he said, it would be ridiculous to warp the philosophy of nature in order to bring out results that are pleasing to the tiny parasites of this insignificant planet. Okay, so in case you didn't catch that, by the way, you are the parasites that he's talking about here, okay? which I find very interesting because I, I do a lot of study. I've written some books on Hitler and such, and that was actually a trope that the Nazis used quite frequently uh, concerning the Jews, uh, that the Jews were parasites in society. So uh, this is a very interesting, uh, and this is written before the Nazi period, uh, but still uh, to call humans parasites shows his really utter contempt for humanity. And by the way, I think this really does show too that uh, a point that I try to make throughout my book that there's a lot of secular philosophies that uh, call themselves humanism. I mean, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a famous essay called Existentialism is a Humanism, for example. Karl Marx called his philosophy humanism. You know, you have the, the humanist manifesto of the one and two of the 20th century and the secular humanism and such. So there's all these people calling themselves humanists, but I think this way that Bertrand Russell here frames this sort of shows, and I think you've seen a lot of other things too, and I try to show it in greater depth in a lot of my work, uh, that really they have no basis for humanism. They have no basis for the value of human life if they believe that human life has no meaning, purpose, you know, intrinsic morality and such. And so I think uh, Bertrand Russell here is being very consistent with his worldview by making these kinds of statements you know, in, in, in his philosophy. Uh, and when he tried to talk about what that meant for morality, Bertrand Russell said morality is just your subjective emotions. So when we say, thou shalt not kill, we don't mean that there's anything objectively wrong in the cosmos about murdering or killing. What we mean is, what we really are saying is, I don't like killing. You know, I, I just don't like it. You know, it's this subjective feeling that I have about that thing. that I, I just don't prefer that. Uh, and so that's all that uh, morality is. It's just subjective desires, expression of our emotions, and such. But then what's interesting is if you take, if you look at Bertrand Russell and you look at his philosophy, I and mean, it's very consistent, you know, in his secular philosophy, just I've laid it out to you here. But then when you look at his life and how he tried to apply these things to the real world, what you find out is that he wasn't really very consistent to that. For example, uh, he, he said at one point, I think I have a slide showing you this one. Yeah, here's one. Here's a slide of a, a saying of Bertrand Russell in one of his uh, very moralistic writings, which he, did have, which he wrote quite a few. He said, three passions, simple but overwhelmingly strong, have governed my life. The longing for love, the search for knowledge, and the unbearable pity for the suffering of mankind. Well, I guess his emotions got away with him here. You know? <laughs> his claim that morality is just an expression of emotions, well, then I guess that's just an expression of his emotions. And maybe he would agree with that. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's interesting that he claims that his whole life is animated 
by these things too. So if this is what's animating his life, you know, these moral convictions, love, uh, pity for suffering of humans, uh, then there, it does seem to suggest that he understands there's something deeper here. And in fact, uh, there's some things that he uh, did and wrote that actually are pretty stunning in this respect. He actually spent time in jail for his pacifist convictions. He was opposed to nuclear arms race, and so he uh, was part of this campaign for nuclear disarmament in Britain. Uh, and so you have to ask yourself, and here's a, a shot showing you a, 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 a thing published with uh, Einstein and Bertrand Russell trying to uh, focus on peace and end to war, and notice to the world, renounce war or perish, world peace or universal death. So, I mean, why is Bertrand Russell so concerned about war and nuclear arms? Well, it's because he realized there is something fundamentally wrong about blow us blowing each other up. You know, so, you recognize, so at some level, Russell is understanding that human life has value, even though he says in his philosophy, we don't. There's no value to humans. But then at some level, he recognizes that humans do have value and that there is uh, moral significance. In fact, his daughter, uh, Catherine Tate, wrote a book called My Life with Bertrand Russell, where she argues that he was an absolutist morally, uh, despite his philosophy. And so she, ar she argues this, it's not just my, me criticizing, I mean, other people very close to me, his own daughter said that that was the case as well. In fact, she, interestingly, ended up converting to Christianity uh, later. Uh, in life, uh, and uh, remarked a lot about his, uh, the way he was raised and other kinds of things, and I can't get into that right now. But anyway, she, she remarked that he was a moralist, that he uh, was, uh, and she said he was very absolutist in his moral convictions, and I think there's a good deal to say about that. But then there's a really interesting uh, aspect of Russell that comes out in some of his private correspondence, and this is what really blew me away when I was uh, looking at Russell, because not only did he understand somewhere in the depths of his soul that there are moral good, that there are things that are morally good, he also understood deep in his soul that there was a God, even though he refused to admit it uh, publicly uh, and even to himself refused to admit it in one sense. And, and the way we know this is because in 1916 he wrote a letter to a woman that he was in love with and he sort of bared his soul to her in ways that he never would have done publicly. And it's very interesting. And, and by the way, one of the reasons that I, I, I'm bringing this out too to you here is that I think this can actually give us some encouragement sometimes too when you're talking to someone that may seem like the most hard-nosed uh, atheist, agnostic, you know, unbeliever, antagonistic to Christianity. There may be things going on inside of them that you don't know about you know, that might give you a leverage in their life. Now, unfortunately, as far as I know, Bertrand Russell never converted to Christianity and never overcame his atheistic worldview. He went to his grave, as far as I know, an atheist. But still, he was wrestling with things inside that uh, he wasn't letting on in his philosophy. So here's, here's what he said in a letter that he wrote. And this, is, this really is powerful. He said, I am strangely unhappy because the pattern of my life is complicated because my nature is hopelessly complicated. So he's understanding there's this wrestling going on, so this stuff, there's things going on inside of me. He says, I'm a mass of contradictory impulses. So I'm talking to my book about these contradictions. Well, he recognized there was contradictions. He said, I'm a, I'm a mass of contradictory impulses, and out of all this, to my intense sorrow, pain to you must grow, talking to this lady. And then he went on to say, the center of me is always and eternally a terrible pain, a curious, wild pain, a searching for something beyond what the world contains, something transfigured and infinite, the beatific vision, God, I do not find it, I do not think it is to be found, but the love of it is my life. It's like passionate love for a ghost. You know, so there's a sense in which he had this longing for God that he even knows it, he even says it here. But somehow he still doesn't think it exists. He thinks it's just a specter of his imagination. It's just a ghost. I, I mean, this, he says, I have this passionate love for a ghost. And then he went on to say, at times it fills me with rage, at times with wild despair. It is the source of gentleness and cruelty and work. It fills every passion that I have. 
It is the actual spring of life within me. I can't explain it or make it seem anything but foolishness. But whether foolishness or not, it is the source of whatever is good in me. At most times now, I am not conscious of it, only when I am strongly stirred, either happily or unhappily. I seek escape from it, though I don't believe I ought to." So this is a really, he's really a conflicted individual when you see what he's, as he's bearing his soul here and saying, I kind of want to escape from it, but I don't really know if I should. And he says, it's, it's, it's the source, he says here, it's, it's the source of everything that's good in me. You know, this longing for God, wanting transcendence and such. So all these moralistic things that he was going through, everything was springing from this desire for the infinite, for transcendence, what he calls the beatific vision here. But unfortunately, he never came to recognize uh, the reality of that. He still convinced himself that, you know, no, uh, humans really don't have any value, and there is no God to give them any kind of value. So Bertrand Russell is a really powerful example of this kind of contradiction that I see where someone on the one hand is philosophizing and saying there is no value to human life, there's no meaning, no purpose, no objective morality. But on the other hand, within his soul, he knows better and there's contradictions in his life that show that he can't really live consistently with that. Now there's a lot of other examples and I'll give just a couple more here. Jerry Coyne, I think I mentioned him earlier here. He is an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago. He's actually emeritus now. He's retired, but he's still writing and he has a blog that he blogs a lot uh, called Why Evolution is True. Uh, but he wrote this book just a few, couple years ago called Fact versus, Faith rather, versus Fact, Why Science and Religion Are Incompatible. And so uh, he's trying to bash Christianity and any other kind of uh, religion. Uh, and in the course of all of that, and in, not just in this book, but in many of his other writings and on his blog and such, he asserts pretty clearly uh, that life has no overarching meaning or purpose you know, life is meaningless. It's just come about through random processes over time, through evolutionary processes and such. And so there's no meaning or purpose. There's no teleology. Uh, in fact, he said it quite explicitly on a, a, a YouTube video where he said that evolution, quote, here he says, says that there is no special purpose for your life because it is a naturalistic philosophy. We have no more extrinsic purpose than a squirrel or an armadillo. Okay, so again, this equating humans and animals. You know, we're no, we're no more significant than any kind of animals uh, there. But then I find it very interesting because Jerry Coyne gets really angry and upset when people like me point out that certain uh, horrible things are done by people with uh, purposes that derive from Darwinism because he's, he's trying to defend Darwinism. And such. So, for example, the Columbine massacre. In fact, I'm going to show that here to you just a little bit. Here, when I talk about the consequence of it, uh, he's when uh, when people point out that the guy who uh, shot up the Columbine school was wearing a natural selection T-shirt, which he was, and I'll show you the slide later where, where he has a, where it shows that. Uh, he gets infuriated at that and says, "Why are you blaming Darwinism for all these things? You know, it has nothing to do with that. It's just some deranged kid, you know, you know, doing stuff and all that kind of thing." <clears throat> But then I step back and I say, well, well, wait a minute, Jerry. Why are you getting so upset you know, about the Columbine massacre you know, if there's no value to human life? Who cares? So what? Some kids shot up some other kids. So what? You shoot up armadillos. You shoot up squirrels. He just said we don't have any more value than squirrels or armadillos. So people shoot up squirrels and armadillos all the time. And no one gets up. You don't get upset about that. So why are you worried about it? You know, these, these kids getting killed in school shoot shootings and such. So I think there is a, a very real sense in which Jerry Coyne knows that human life has value and he's reacting in that way because he knows that. He knows that we're not just a bunch of squirrels and armadillos, even though his philosophy tells him that we are and he tries to promote that particular perspective. And then in his book, uh, Faith Versus Fact, he argues very forthrightly that morality is an evolved phenomenon so there's nothing objective about it. It could have evolved differently over time. It's a, it's a matter of chance events that took place over time. In fact, I was at a, a conference at San Diego State University on the implications of Darwinism back in, during the uh, 150th anniversary of 
uh, Darwin's uh, Origin of Species. Uh, and the, uh, one of the speakers there uh, said, it's just a flip of the coin that we don't have different morality than we have. So in fact, what he said, he, he actually said that, he said, you know, uh, black widows, the uh, female devours the male after they mate. He said, it's just a flip of the coin that we're not like that, you know, that we don't do that, same thing. And he said, if we were like that, then all of our uh, so social systems, our religious systems, everything would all revolve around you know, that, and that would be a good thing, and that would be part of our morality. So it's just you know, it's just chance event that we have the morality that we have. And Jerry Coyne makes the, that kind of argument that morality is just something that's evolved. By the way, Darwin made that same argument. This is not something that's modern idea in terms of Darwinian biology. Darwin made that argument, too, that, that morality was an evolved trait that evolved over time. Uh, and in fact, Darwin actually believed that different races had different morality based on their levels of evolutionary uh, attainment. <clears throat> that's, that's not an idea that Darwinian biologists today embrace, however, of course. Uh, but still, they do embrace the idea that morality is an evolved trait. Okay? So it's just, uh, it doesn't have any particular objectivity. However, interestingly, he then contradicts himself later in the book by claiming that his version of secular morality, he just calls it secular morality, is superior to religious morality. Well, if secular morality is, is, is superior to religious morality, that means there's some norm outside of both of them by which you're measuring them. You have to have something you're measuring it by if one is higher and superior, better than the other. So there's some way in which he knows that there are, is objective morality, even though he may have it twisted, he may have it wrong, but he still recognizes somehow there is some kind of objective morality out there. So again, there's that tension and contradiction that I think that shows that you know, somehow deep down they know better than the kinds of things that they're saying overtly that they've convinced themselves in their minds. Another good example of this is Peter Singer. Uh, Peter Singer is an Australian uh, bioethicist, philosopher, who now holds an endowed chair at Princeton University in the United States uh, for the Center for Human Values there. Uh, and Singer also argues that human life is not intrinsically valuable. In fact, I, I did a, a debate with uh, Peter Singer on the radio show Unbelievable uh, out of uh, London uh, on that very uh, question, is human life intrinsically valuable? And I was taking the yes side, and Singer was taking the no side. Uh, and uh, so Singer denies, then, that human life has intrinsic value. You know, his book here, Unsanctifying Human Life, kind of gives you that uh, feel for it. Okay, he's trying to get rid of the sanctity of human life idea. Uh, this one here, Rethinking Life and Death, the Collapse of Our Traditional Ethics, and the traditional ethics he's talking about here are Judeo-Christian ethics, that he wants to see collapse uh, there and is trying to... And look who, uh, look who endorsed the book, by the way, Derek Humphrey, who's the head of, uh, who, author of Final Exit, is one of the biggest proponents of uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia, uh, promoting uh, Singer's book there. In any case, uh, Singer denies pretty clearly that human life has intrinsic value. Uh, and here's a shot of him next to one of his uh, sayings, that the life of a newborn, the newborn human, in other words, is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. Again, uh, Singer's big on animal rights, uh, but he thinks some humans don't have the same rights as animals. And this is because Singer, along with others, uh, other bioethicists, and this is a fairly common idea among a lot of bioethicists, believes that some humans are persons and some humans are not persons. This is known as personhood theory. Okay, and so Singer says you have to ha have some kind of cognitive level before you, some threshold of cognitive abilities before you reach personhood. And until you reach that cognitive level, and by the way, they're very uh, vague about where that level actually is. It's very arbitrary. They have no way of defining where that is or even, wh even what, the, what the cognitive functions have to be. In fact, I actually pressed Singer on that in the debate. Uh, I said, well, I said, look, you claim that, uh, in the debate I told him, okay, you claim that it, that a human has to have a certain amount of rationality, ability to plan the future, and such, and that's what gives human life value. That human life doesn't have value as, aside from that. So you choose these particular characteristics. 
But then I said, well, there's another bioethicist named Joseph Fletcher, who actually is much earlier. He was starting right in the 1950s, 1960s. He's actually the originator of personhood theory, really. He's one of the earliest ones it was pushing for in the 1950s and 1960s. I said, Joseph Fletcher actually identified 15 different characteristics that he thought helped to define human personhood. And I said, why do you choose the particular uh, ones that you choose? You know, how, do you, how do you defend that? And I was kind of astonished because he didn't defend it. He just said, well, we can discuss which characteristics you know, uh, qualify. You know, per, per. So I was kind of astonished because I mean, that's the whole basis of his, his philosophy of personhood or that is based on these particular characteristics. He wouldn't even defend the particular characteristics that he claims to hold. But he, in his books, he, he lays out basically rationality and ability to plan for the future. Those are the biggest ones that he, he emphasizes uh, a great deal. But if you don't have those, then you're not a person. So uh, according to him, even a newborn infant is not a person. Because a newborn infant, he doesn't think, has a high enough cognitive level. And that's, like I said, this thing, a newborn, he's talking about a newborn person, human being. The life of a newborn human is of less value than the life of a pig and such. Uh, it would also be people who have dementia at the end of life as well. You know, they could have, reach a level where they don't have enough cognitive functioning, where they would no longer qualify as being a person. And this is a pretty prominent idea in bioethics circles. Singer's not the only one. He's one of the more radical of them. Uh, but there's a lot of bioethicists that are buying into this uh, kind of idea. In fact, uh, a few years back in the Journal of Medical Ethics, there were some bioethicists who published an article calling for afterbirth abortion. Uh, and there was a big blow up on that. In fact, there was actually a debate in the, the US Congress actually debated that article. Uh, and there were some, uh, some congressmen who uh, came out strongly against that article when it came out. And the, the journal editor, Julian Savalescu, whom I actually talk about a good bit in my book, because he's a transhumanist leader. He's a professor at Oxford University. He's the editor of the Journal of Medical Ethics. Uh, Savalescu said, what's all the blow up about? Bioists have been saying the same stuff for you know, decades. You know, why are you getting, all get, get so upset about this? You know, after birth abortion. So uh, that's the kind of thing that we're seeing come upon us uh, through these uh, secular philosophies that are denying the the value of human life. But again, they don't have a real basis to make that. And again, Singer himself won't even pin a date. Singer won't even say. Now he used, Singer in, earlier in his career at one point said that he thought that people should be able to wait 30 days after birth to decide whether to keep their child or not. He's backed off of that position, but he won't draw a line now. He won't say any, when that decision should be made, but he still clearly thinks that newborns don't qualify as persons. Okay, the last point that I was going to make was that uh, we also can point to various kinds of negative repercussions or consequences that come out of devaluing human life with these secular philosophies. So uh, viewing humans as just a cosmic accident, which is how secular philosophies basically see humans, we're just a cosmic accident. In fact, we're actually a colossal accident because we're the result of millions of copying mistakes you know, according to the evolutionary worldview, you know, we're the result of millions of, of copying mistakes that have happened over time, so we're just an incredible accident. And once you believe that humans are just a cosmic accident, this leads to categorizing some humans as more valuable than others very often, even though there's really no criteria, objective criteria, but somehow they somehow come up with criteria like Singer with his rationality. And by the way, Singer has no, no, as far as I can tell, Singer really doesn't have a good argument for why rationality is important. If, if rationality is also the, the uh, chance product of the universe, if it's also just an accident, then rationality doesn't, make any, doesn't have any significance or a purpose either. Uh, so, uh, but somehow, Singer and many others do try to have some kind of criteria to judge you know, people, certain people having certain values and others. And so this has actually led to mass murder in some cases. So the communist regimes uh, the, who are uh, seeing some people as having more value than others, the proletariat having more value than the bourgeoisie or trying to suppress the bourgeoisie and such. Uh, so you have communist regimes like Lenin and Stalin and Mao and others uh, who have committed mass murder over these issues. You have Nazi Germany, which I've done a lot of study myself on. I've got several books out about Hitler. My most recent one is called Hitler's Religion. Uh, you know, Nazi Germany was categorizing people. They were doing it by race, not like the, not the, the, uh, the communists were doing it by economic status. Uh, the Germans were doing it by 
race or by biological ability. So in this case, this uh, shot here is of uh, Hadamar, which was uh, a, one of the places where they killed people with disabilities. They killed over 10,000 people with disabilities at Hadamar. And interestingly, by the way, the Nazis were not having to uh, uh, twist people's arms to do this. When they reached their 10,000th victim, the people at Hadamar threw a party and celebrated their 10,000th victim uh, that they killed of uh, people with disabilities. The Germans over, throughout the World War II, the Nazis killed about 200,000 people with disabilities. These are Germans with disabilities. They actually killed tens of thousands more in occupied territories. We don't even have a good number for that, but they killed 200,000 Germans with disabilities in addition to the six million Jews and the uh, three to 400,000 gypsies and the several million Soviet POWs and the others that they killed uh, as well because they, uh, believed that they were inferior one way or another and by adopting this kind of uh, Darwinian worldview. Uh, some secularists trying to be consistent, interestingly, will even argue that Hitler was not evil. You know, if you try to be consistent, in fact, I've, I've talked to people and I think I told you, you know, people say, you know, uh, when I was, uh, uh, I, I mentioned earlier in my talk here about the San Diego State University, the conference I went to, at that same conference I talked to a philosophy graduate student who found out I was studying in evolutionary ethics and he started talking about it and it became clear that he was a, a proponent of evolutionary ethics and so I just popped the Hitler question to him and said, well, what about Hitler? You know, I studied modern Germany and Nazi Germany and stuff and what about Hitler? And the guy uh, sort of hemmed and hawed a little bit. He didn't like the question, but he said, well, I don't like Hitler. And I said, well, that's not what I'm asking. You know, I'm not asking, well, you like Hitler. <laughs> you know, was he evil? You know, and finally, he said, no, you know, there's, there's no objective evil. So no, Hitler was not evil. And he finally actually even said Hitler was OK. That, that was kind of startling. Uh, but that's what he said, because they don't have any basis for uh, judging Hitler. You know, what, would the, what would that basis be? But yet they do get upset with a lot of things, especially when you accuse them of kinds of things. So here's two examples of uh, mass murderers in European and American society uh, who have been driven by Darwinian understandings and, and secular uh, ways of secular thinking. Uh, uh, Pekka Erik Ovinen here on the right in 2007 was in Finland uh, and shot up his high school uh, there. Uh, before he did it, uh, he made a YouTube video, and this is actually from the YouTube video that he made, so that actually is him in the YouTube video pointing a gun at the, toward the screen with a thing saying, humanity is overrated. Uh, and he actually wrote a manifesto uh, before killing eight students uh, in that Finland school shooting. Uh, and in his manifesto, uh, he said that he loved biological evolution. Uh, one of his cyber nicknames was Natural Selector. Uh, and he stated in his manifesto, quote, humans are just a species among other animals and world, and does not, excuse me, humans are just a species among other animals, and the world does not exist only for humans. Death and killing is not a tragedy. It happens in nature all the time between all species. Not all human lives are important or worth saving. So that was his view that he was learning from these secular ideas. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. everything's permitted. That's right, yeah. yeah. If there's no God, everything's permitted. Uh, Eric Harris. Uh, wrote a journal, and he actually did wear, this is not Eric Harris, this is a, a film reconstruction of it, but uh, he did wear a t-shirt that said natural selection on it on the day that he was shooting up Columbine High School. Uh, and in his journal, he wrote things like, I just love Hobbes and Nietzsche. Uh, he also wrote about his love for natural selection uh, and his desire to help the weak and the sick to die off, to help Darwinian evolution out. Uh, at one point in his journal, he said, quote, there's no such thing as true good or true evil. It's all relative to the observer. It's just all nature, chemistry, and math. Deal with it. In another place in his journal, he said, just because your mommy and daddy told you blood and violence is bad, you think it's a law of nature? Wrong. Only science and math are true. Everything, and I mean everything else, is man-made. So morality is all just man-made and such. And that's what he got out of his, these secular philosophies that he was uh, reading. And it was no uh, mistake, it was no chance, by the way, that he did his shooting on uh, April 20th, uh, Hitler's birthday, uh, because he was also very heavily into 
uh, reading Hitler and into Nazism and such, spreading some of the same kind of ideas. Now, okay, we can look at that and say, okay, these are some crazed kids that are taking these ideas in weird ways uh, and such. But if we step back and sort of think about our broader society, uh, we see that especially in intellectual and secular circles, uh, but even in broader segments of society as well, today we have pretty easy acceptance of abortion, infanticide in many cases, euthanasia, assisted suicide, uh, and it's spreading. There, again, there's many places where uh, has not, euthanasia and assisted suicide is still not legal and it's getting struck down a lot of places. Finland, just, uh, uh, they just lost it there. Uh, remains to be seen. Spain, I think, is going to have a vote here pretty soon, uh, at least in one of, the, one of the states of Spain, or I think it was Spain altogether. Uh, Ireland is going to have a referendum on abortion here coming up uh, soon. Uh, so we do see this culture of death uh, spreading over time. And in the United States, more states are taking on assisted suicide uh, as well. So we do see this culture of death spreading. And I, do, I don't have time to get into that anymore, but I do uh, spend a chapter in Death and Humanity talking about abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, and assisted suicide, as, and the way that uh, these secular philosophies have brought about that way of thinking. In fact, I say I have a chapter. I actually have other things throughout a lot of other chapters, too, talking about it. But I have an entire chapter devoted just to that particular perspective.